Hello and welcome back. We are on chapter 16 in materials kinetics, which is the viscosity of liquids. So the outline for today is that first we're going to introduce the concept of viscosity, its definition, as well as several viscosity reference points that are used throughout the industry. Then we will get into various viscosity measurement techniques, then one of the most interesting parts of the lecture is this classification of strong versus fragile liquids. And we will then get into various models that describe the temperature dependence of the viscosity curve, which is non-Arrhenius. Um, and then uh, we are going to finish up with a few special cases. So uh, first, what is viscosity? Um, you know, up till this point in the course, we've dealt mostly with the kinetics of solid materials. Uh, now we are going to turn to the liquid state, and viscosity is um, probably the key property that characterizes the kinetics of the liquid state. Uh, liquids flow under the force of gravity or any other applied force, and the resistance to that flow is described by the viscosity. That means the greater the viscosity, the slower the flow. Or in other words, viscosity is the inverse of fluidity. Uh, something like water at room temperature has a very low viscosity because it flows quickly. Something like honey has a much higher viscosity because it flows more slowly. So what is the specific definition of viscosity? Uh, first, I should point out that when we say viscosity almost all the time, what we really mean is the shear viscosity and specifically the coefficient of shear viscosity, which is given by eta. And this is defined as being the shear stress divided by the shear strain rate. The greater the viscosity, the greater the applied stress required for a given rate of deformation. The equation to describe that is shown here. On the left-hand side, this sigma sub xy is the shear stress, and then the shear strain deformation rate is this e with a dot. This is just the time derivative of the shear strain. Um, the subscripts here, xy, since there's two subscripts, that means uh, biaxial stress and strain, or in other words, a shear stress and strain. And then the coefficient of proportionality between the two is the coefficient of shear viscosity, or simply um, called the viscosity. So if somebody says eta, what they usually mean is this coefficient of shear viscosity. The units for the shear viscosity, um, the SI units are Pascal seconds. Um, you can see that here because the unit of the shear stress is Pascals. The unit of the, the strain deformation rate is uh, unitless per second because the strain is unitless. And then when you take the time derivative, it's per second. So if you multiply both sides by the deformation rate, you can see, um, or if you divide both sides by the deformation rate, you can see that it's Pascal times second, which is the uh, units of shear viscosity here, Pascal seconds. Um, so the greater the viscosity, the greater the applied stress that's required for a given rate of deformation. The other unit that you will see is the poise, Poise is an older unit. You'll see that in some of the older literature, although it's still used in um, some parts of industry as well. The conversion factor between Pascal seconds and poise is easy. It's just a factor of 10 difference, where one Pascal second is equal to uh, 10 poise. Um, oftentimes, you'll see viscosities in logarithmic units because, as we'll see, the viscosity changes by orders of magnitude. And so if you have a base 10 uh, logarithm of viscosity, then uh, if that's in Pascal seconds, you just add one to it to get uh, the base 10 logarithm in poise. Why is the liquid viscosity so important? Um, you know, there's a lot of materials processing that takes place in the liquid state. Um, the entire glass industry, for example, and uh, a large part of the polymers industry, uh, the, you know, shaping of those materials is done in the liquid state. And so the temperature dependence of liquid viscosity is important because it determines uh, everything about the glass or polymer manufacturing process. It also determines the maximum use temperature of the glass or polymer product before it starts to deform. 
um, the viscosity temperature curve determines the design requirements and operating conditions for melting furnaces, as well as all the forming equipment to get the glass or the polymer in exactly the shape that you want. Now, within the industry, there are some uh, viscosity reference points that are defined on this uh, viscosity versus temperature curve. What you see on the left here on this y-axis is the base 10 logarithm of viscosity. Um, this is with the viscosity units of Pascal seconds, and this is some function of temperature. And, and where this is positioned on the temperature axis has a strong dependence on the composition of the glass or polymer. But what you'll see is that as a function of temperature, like if you start here at high temperature, the viscosity is very low, like maybe on the order of 10 to the minus 2 Pascal second. But as you cool, as you cool the system down, the viscosity is increasing by orders of magnitude. Um, so it's an enormous change in viscosity as a function of temperature. And in order to in order to make comparisons between different compositions, it is conventional to define a, a set of viscosity reference points, namely the melting point, which is not the thermodynamic melting point, rather it's the viscosity where typical glass melting occurs, um, the working point, the softening point, the glass transition temperature, also known as the annealing point, and then the strain point. So the melting point here, if we start at the high temperature end, is the temperature at which the viscosity is about 10 pascal seconds. This corresponds to a typical temperature used for glass melting um, in order to get the right flow behavior in the melting tank. And this is not related to the thermodynamic melting point. So the thermodynamic melting point is where the Gibbs free energy of the crystal phase is equal to that of the liquid phase. And this melting point has nothing to do with thermodynamics. It is only about viscosity and having the viscosity equal to 10 Pascal seconds. Now, if you take this um, high temperature liquid and you cool it down, the next viscosity reference point that is defined as the working point. This is the temperature at which the viscosity is 10 to the three Pascal seconds. This is the viscosity at which a machine is, is able to work on the glass forming melt without losing control. So this is where we start to um, form the liquid into the shape that we want it to have, and the liquid can retain some of that shape during that forming process. Uh, if you continue to cool, uh, the viscosity continues to go up by orders of magnitude, and the next viscosity reference point is the softening point. The softening point is the temperature at which the viscosity is 10 to the 6.6 .6 pascal seconds. This is the approximate viscosity at which a glass or polymer will deform under its own weight on the time scale of the manufacturing process. Um, so most of the forming uh, takes place between the, the working uh, point and the softening point. Um, next up, if you keep cooling, uh, the next commonly defined viscosity reference point is the glass transition temperature or the annealing point. Uh, they both mean the same thing in the context of viscosity, and they are the temperature at which the viscosity is equal to 10 to the 12 pascal seconds. Um, this is given its name annealing point because um, this is where you would perform some sort of uh, heat treatment on um, the glass or the polymer body in order to relieve stresses from it. So if there's differential cooling that can create stresses in the object, and those stresses are relieved on, um, in a matter of minutes if you are holding it in a furnace at the annealing point. It's also called the glass transition temperature because this is approximately where um, a liquid, liquid will convert into a glass upon cooling. This is where we get usually uh, the falling out of equilibrium and a freezing in of the liquid structure, uh, which is a gradual process. Um, and we'll have more about the glass transition coming up in the next lecture. But if we continue to cool the system and the viscosity continues to go up, the final viscosity reference point of interest is the strain point. The strain point is the temperature at which the viscosity is 10 to the 13.5 pascal second. Um, this is where the stresses will be relieved on the order of hours instead of minutes. And the strain point is also 
a rough indication of the upper um, upper use temperature or short-term use of a product. In other words, if, if you were to heat uh, a glass or a polymer above its strain point, it's going to deform on a typical use time scale. But as long as you keep it below the strain point, you should generally be okay for most use. Um, now, one thing to note about these viscosity reference points is the arbitrariness of the definitions here. So unlike thermodynamically determined transition temperatures, such as the thermodynamic melting point or boiling point, um, the points characterizing viscosity here, these viscosity reference points are somewhat arbitrarily defined just based on their utility within an industrial manufacturing environment. For example, um, a glass can be annealed over a range of temperatures, um, either somewhat above or somewhat below the annealing point. It doesn't have to be exactly at the annealing point. Um, likewise, the glass can be melted at temperatures um, somewhat above or below the melting point. Um, the melting point here that's defined is just because it is um, a typical melting point that is used within the industry. Now, if we go back to some older literature, this comes from uh, George Hares uh, of the former Corning Glassworks. Uh, these are some typical process viscosities that are used in the glass manufacturing process, um, where uh, glass at the melting end of the tank is typically at a viscosity of about 100 to 500 poise. This is poise because it's older literature. Um, so this would correspond to uh, 10 or 10 to 50 Pascal seconds. Um, and then at the working end of the glass tank, it's 200 to 1000 poise. Pressing, if you were to press the product, that occurs at a viscosity of around 1000 to 7000 poise. Um, the ribbon machine that was invented to have mass production of incandescent light bulbs that operates at a viscosity of 3,000 to 10,000 poise. Uh, tubing is typically made at viscosities of 20,000 to 100,000 poise, and the Corning Glassworks sheet uh, process is at a higher viscosity still on the order of 100,000 to 1 million poise. And what you can see is that depending upon the type of process that is used to shape the product, different processes operate at different viscosities and those viscosities can order by, it can vary by orders of magnitude. So it's really important to you know, consider the details of the process to see where you need to be in terms of viscosity. So we've already seen that viscosity varies by many orders of magnitude with respect to temperature. There is also a large variation of viscosity with respect to composition. And in fact, these different lines here show different viscosity temperature curves of various products that have been commercialized by Corning Glassworks. Um, this 0080 composition is a typical soda lime silicate. Uh, you can see that it's kind of in the middle here with respect to the viscosity versus temperature curve. This uh, 1720 is a higher temperature um, aluminosilicate glass where this um, viscosity is shifted up to higher temperatures. If you keep going, one of the highest ones is actually fused silica. This is pure SiO2, which has a very high viscosity curve, which is why it's so difficult to, uh, to process and why it's so expensive. Uh, just about anything that you add to silica is going to lower the viscosity curve, except for this uh, dashed line here, which shows a nitrated silica, because if you replace oxygen with nitrogen, um, it's giving a, a network that um, is uh, you know, more tightly bonded. You've got more uh, you know, three bonds per nitrogen as opposed to two bonds per oxygen. And the greater network connectivity gives you a higher viscosity. Now, because viscosity varies by so many orders of magnitude with respect to temperature, you know, it's, it's going from something that's highly fluid at high temperatures to something that's effectively a solid at very low temperatures. Um, what this means is that there's not a single measurement technique that can be applied across the entire range of viscosities. Um, therefore, we need to apply a, a combination of different experimental measurement techniques to measure viscosity across different regimes. Now, in this table here, uh, we show first in the melting regime, 
um, that there are two methods that can be used. One is the Stokes falling sphere or bubble rise method, which is um, used if viscosity is less than about 10 to the fourth Pascal seconds. This is, um, if you get the falling sphere technique, you would take basically a stainless steel ball, drop it into the liquid, and measure how long it takes for it to sink to the bottom. And the longer it takes, the higher the viscosity is. Um, it depends on the density difference between the ball and the liquid um, and the radius of the ball. And then from that, you can get the viscosity of the fluid. Um, the other way that you can do this is with the bubble rise method where you inject a bubble at the bottom of the column and then see how long it takes for the bubble to rise to the top. Um, Again, this is just based on a density difference between the bubble and the fluid and the radius of the bubble. And from that, you can get the viscosity. Um, this isn't commonly used, though, because it would only give you the viscosity at um, a single temperature. Um, the more commonly used technique is the rotating cylinder technique from Margul's. Um, this, uh, we're, we'll get into details of this method, but it covers a much wider range of viscosities and you can adjust the temperature during the measurement to get uh, a pretty broad range of um, temperatures measured um, all within a, a single run of the viscometer. Uh, but if you get to higher viscosities, we need other techniques. Um, the ones that are most commonly used are the parallel plate technique the fiber elongation technique and the beam bending technique. So those are the ones that we are going to cover in this lecture. But let's get back to the high temperature regime where we've got fairly low viscosity. Um, the rotational viscometer method developed by Margulis is the um, kind of de facto standard for measuring viscosity in this range. Um, the setup here is that you've got a crucible here in the middle. That crucible contains your liquid at whatever temperature it's in. This crucible is contained within a furnace, and you can adjust the temperature of the furnace, and that will adjust the temperature within the crucible. Uh, now, uh, sort of dipped into that is this spindle. Um, for a high temperature measurement, usually the spindle is made out of platinum because it can withstand high temperatures and be non-reactive with the glass melts. For polymers, you can get away with um, much less expensive materials because um, the temperatures are so much lower for um, organic systems compared to inorganic systems. But the spindle is on a rod here and it's co connected to a motor and this uh, spins the spindle. And uh, basically what the viscometer does is it measures um, how much stress that you need, how much shear, shear stress you need to get a given shear strain rate for the spindle um, that is uh, immersed in the liquid. And the higher the viscosity of the liquid, the greater the force that's required to get a particular rotational, uh, rotational speed. So... Um, the useful range here is you know, 1 to 10 to the 6 pascal seconds, sometimes 10 to the 7 pascal seconds. Um, and what you do is, is sweep over a range of temperatures. So the, the furnace will uh, be programmed to, to vary the temperature. And as the temperature is varied, it will measure the viscosity um, as a function of temperatures. And you can cover about six orders of magnitude of viscosity with this technique. Now, the usual method is that the crucible here is fixed and the spindle is rotating. There is an alternative way that you can do this where it's the opposite, where the spindle is fixed and the crucible is spinning. Um, same principle, though. If we zoom in on the crucible, you can see what the spindle looks like here. So this is the crucible. Um, then this is the uh, fluid with its viscosity. And then the spindle is immersed in that and it spins. It has some rotational velocity to it. Um, all right, the next method, if we go to uh, lower temperatures or higher viscosities is the fiber elongation method. With the fiber elongation method, a glass fiber is suspended in a furnace and it is allowed to either flow under its own weight or if the temperature is low enough, sometimes one would attach a weight to the bottom of the fiber. So it's not just flowing under its own weight, but that of an additional weight that has been attached to it. 
And then you measure the rate of elongation of the fiber at that particular temperature. And after calibrating with known standards, you can get um, the viscosity from that. So the, the faster the rate of deformation, the lower the viscosity. Um, this is a kind of a, a quick and dirty method for getting viscosity. It is useful in that it can cover a pretty wide range of viscosities and it's fairly easy to do. Um, however, it is lacking in precision. Um, other methods will give you uh, much more precise values of viscosity. And so this is really mostly used as a guide. Um, a more precise method it, in that a similar viscosity regime or kind of around the softening point range here, 10 to the five through 10 to the nine Pascal seconds is the parallel plate method. Uh, with the parallel plate method, there is some pedestal here with a stage and there is a, a small disc of the sample that is um, basically, uh, you know, you, you prepare the sample as a disc shape with whatever um, grinding and polishing that it needs. And then a load rod comes down on the other side of the disc. Um, and then this load rod is spun. And then based on the ratio of the, um, the amount of shear stress that's needed to get a particular shear strain rate, that gives you the viscosity um, of the disc. So here the sa sample is sandwiched between these two flat par parallel surfaces. One surface is fixed, the other is a free, free to rotate. Um, and then once you calibrate that with known standards, then that can get you the viscosity. And usually this is kind of calibrated to give you exactly the softening point, uh, but with proper calibration, it can also extend um, as low as 10 to the five Pascal seconds or as high as about 10 to the nine Pascal seconds. Now, if you keep going to lower temperatures, the uh, I'd say by far the most useful technique at low temperatures is the beam bending technique. With the beam bending technique, you've got a rectangular sample here um, that is supported at two points on the outer side. It is put in a three-point bend configuration where you've got some load that is pressed down in the middle here. This is either pressing it down or perhaps hanging a weight here from the middle. Um, but in any case, you put this beam in a three-point bending configuration and then measure the rate of deflection. But then after calibrating with known standards, um, you can get the viscosity from that rate of deflection, where a faster rate indicates a lower viscosity. And uh, this, in principle, can go from 10 to the 7 through 10 to the 16 Pascal seconds. In practice, it would be pretty difficult to do it at such a low viscosity because the deflection rate would be so high. And um, you know, once the uh, the beam is deformed, that changes the geometry. So that changes the uh, mathematical relationship between the uh, deflection rate and the shear viscosity. So normally I would say this is most useful between about 10 to the 11 and um, 10 to the 15 or so Pascal seconds. If you wanna go up to higher viscosities, you can. Uh, I've seen this taken up as high as 10 to the 18 Pascal seconds. It just takes a lot of patience to be able to wait long enough to measure uh, the very slow deflection, deflection rates that occur at 10 to the 18 Pascal seconds. So using a combination of measurement techniques, we can piece together this entire uh, viscosity versus temperature relationship. The next question becomes, what is a suitable equation to describe the temperature dependence of viscosity. Um, and one of the interesting things about the temperature dependence of viscosity is that it is uh, non-Arrhenius, which means we need a more complicated function to capture um, the nonlinearity of the curve if you were to plot the logarithm of the viscosity versus the inverse temperature. And the first successful equation to do that is the vogel fulcher tamman equation. This was proposed um, independently by all three of these scientists, vogel fulcher and Tamman, in the 1920s. Um, out of their work, the, the best paper, the one that was by far the most complete in terms of its analysis and presentation of data was uh, done by Gordon Fulcher. And um, the equation here uh, is that the base 10 logarithm of the viscosity here is equal to some constant 
plus another constant divided by t minus a third constant. So there's three parameters here. And this denominator part here, this t minus t0, is what gives you the non-Iranian shape of the curve. And this goes back to a paper published in the Journal of the American Ceramic Society back in 1925. Now, Gordon Fulcher uh, was a very interesting uh, fellow, a really, really uh, amazing guy. Uh, he was born in 1884 in Evanston, Illinois. Um, that's where Northwestern University is located. He got his PhD in physics at Clark University in 1910, conducted naval research during World War I, and joined uh, Corning Glass Works as a researcher in 1920. Um, he was actually uh, the primary inventor for um, electrocast ceramics, so uh, electric melting of refractory materials. And there's you know an, an entire company that was formed out of this. Uh, even though that was the focus of his research, at that same time, he uh, was able to do a lot of research on viscosity. And that's when he introduced this Fulcher equation for viscosity or VFT equation. Um, interestingly, he, he was also a big proponent of collaboration between industry and academia. And even though he was an industrial scientist, he served as the chief editor of Physical Review, um, which was and, and arguably still is the most uh, important physics journal out there. Um, while he was the editor of Physical Review from 1923 to 1925, he is the person who developed the modern system of abstracting that all scientific journals use today. The, the fact that um, you know pa each paper needs to have an abstract and needs to have keywords. And he was really big on how best to organize um, scientific publishing. And in fact, he took his system of abstracting to the League of Nations and it got approved um, for use you know, across the world. And, and that's why we have this system of abstracting that we have today. Um, he uh, left Corning to become director of research at Corhart Refractories in uh, 1934. This was to pursue his um, work on electrocast refractory materials. Um, he also published a couple of books in um, metacognition, so thinking about thinking. Uh, one of them was Better Thinking for Better Living, 1948, and another book on common sense decision making in 1965. So a really um, interesting person. Now, if we look at his equation here, this vogel fulcher tamman equation, I've rewritten this in terms of kind of a more modern form of expressing it. This is the base 10 logarithm of viscosity. And this um, constant out in front here is really the limit of viscosity uh, as the temperature goes to infinity, because if T goes to infinity here, this term goes to zero, and what you're left with is the log 10 of eta infinity. So this is the infinite temperature limit of viscosity. So this constant plus our other constant here, A, uh, divided by T minus T zero. So there's three unknowns, and usually those are treated as fitting parameters to fit to data. Um, now, one of the things that has been noticed is that despite the great success of the VFT equation over the decades, there are there is some systematic error as you go to lower temperatures. And that should be obvious here from the denominator of this equation with T minus T zero. As T approaches T zero, um, this becomes zero in the denominator, which means this term becomes infinity. And this is what's called dynamic divergence. It's a, kind of a, a byproduct of the functional form here and has led to a whole body of literature of people speculating, is this real? If it is real, what does it mean? And so on. Um, but you know, putting that aside for now, um, what is clear is that there's systematic error in this equation at low temperatures. For example, if you have the, um, the data points here for a B2O3 liquid, and the uh, dashed line here shows the fit with the VFT equation. If you zoom in at the low temperature end, what you can see is that uh, the VFT equation has a steeper slope compared to the data because it is trying to um, diverge to infinity at a finite temperature, whereas you know, from a physical perspective, that really would only occur in the limit of zero temperature. So this is a problem that has been known for some time. Um, this paper goes back to George Shearer in 1992, and several people have proposed alternative equations to describe 
the temperature dependence of viscosity um, that you know take care of this problem of dynamic divergence. Uh, one of the more successful ones is this avramov milchev equation, or AM equation. Uh, this has the base 10 logarithm of, of viscosity equal to the same constant here. This is the base 10 logarithm of the infinite temperature viscosity. But the second um, term has uh, some parameter tau over temperature divided by, or sorry, raised to the power of a parameter alpha. So there's still the same number of parameters here, eta infinity, tau, and alpha. It's a three parameter model, just like the VFT equation. But because of this difference of the functional form, the avramov milchev equation only goes to infinity in the limit of temperature going to zero. So this um, effectively solved the problem of dynamic divergence, uh, gave an equation that had more physical meaning compared to VFT, which was just proposed empirically and provided better fits of the viscosity temperature relationship. And I'll come back to that again in a moment. Uh, but first, I want to introduce the concept of strong and fragile liquids. Uh, this concept goes back to Professor C. Austin Angel, who unfortunately recently passed away. Um, he was a professor at Arizona State University. And uh, what he did was to take the viscosity versus temperature data for a wide variety of different liquids, including oxide liquids like silicon germania, chalcogenide liquids, this is arsenic sulfide, um, ionic liquids like zinc chloride, organic liquids um, like toluene, chlorobenzene, orthotrophenol, and so on. And he took all of this viscosity versus temperature data and he put it onto one master plot where the master plot here has the base 10 logarithm of viscosity in the y-axis and then a normalized inverse temperature on the x-axis. Uh, this is Tg over T. So it is one over the temperature normalized by one over the glass transition temperature where the glass transition temperature is formally defined as where the viscosity of the liquid is equal to 10 to the 12 Pascal seconds. So what this is saying is that the shear viscosity at the glass transition temperature of any composition X, regardless of that composition X, the viscosity always um, is 10 to the 12 Pascal seconds at the glass transition temperature. And because of this definition, definition of the glass transition temperature Tg, that means that where the temperature is equal to the glass transition temperature at Tg over T equals one, um, by definition, um, those curves all pass through um, 10 to the, the 12 uh, Pascal seconds. So on this logarithm scale here, this is 12, where the right-hand side, this is units of log Pascal seconds. So it's 12. If you go over here to the left y-axis, you can see he's got the same thing, but plotted in units of log poise. So it's 12 here on the log Pascal seconds axis, but the glass transition temperature is 13 on the poise axis. So in logarithmic units, you just add one to go from Pascal seconds to poise, assuming it's a base 10 logarithm. So there is a common convergence point here that is by definition of the glass transition temperature. Um, what Angel did was he took all of these data, fitted it, fitted them all to the uh, vogel fulcher tamman equation, and then extrapolated all the way to infinite temperature, where of course there's no data. So this is just um, extrapolated limits here. And what he observed is that most of these liquids appeared to converge to a common viscosity, which is 10 to the minus four poise or 10 to the minus five Pascal seconds. So based on the fitting to the VFT equation and extrapolation to high temperatures, there appears to be a common convergence point in the high temperature limit. Um, the rationale for that is that in the limit of high temperatures, you know, the energetics of bonding doesn't mean anything anymore. It's um, you know, a system that's completely dominated by entropy. And if the nature of the bonding doesn't matter anymore, then in that limit of infinite temperature, um, all of these liquids um, in general should have the same or a very similar viscosity, of course, a very low viscosity. So there's this common point in the infinite temperature limit where Tg over T equals zero. 
uh, there's a common point uh, at the glass transition temperature where Tg over T is equal to one. And what Angel observed was that there are a couple of different types of scaling behaviors where um, two of these liquids here, namely silica and germania, um, exhibit almost a straight line behavior here on this plot, which means um, an array of scaling of the shear viscosity versus temperature. Um, Angel described these as strong liquids. Uh, please note that this um, definition of strong has nothing to do with um, mechanical strength of a solid. Um, he's defining this as a strong liquid, which is a liquid state property, not a solid state property. And what this indicates is that the structure of these liquids is not changing appreciably as a function of temperature. As a result, the activation barrier here, or the slope of this line, is not changing by much as a function of temperature. Therefore, he called them strong liquids. Um, and this is a lot simpler to describe because this could be described using an Arrhenius equation. On the other hand, uh, just about everything else exhibited some departure from Arrhenius scaling of uh, viscosity with respect to temperature. In other words, they're still passing through the same common points in the high temperature limit and at the glass transition temperature, but there's a lot of curvature um, here. And what he called these um, were fragile liquids. So a strong liquid has an Arrhenius scaling. It's a straight line on this plot. A fragile liquid um, has a non arrhenius scaling, which means that the slope here is changing as a function of temperature. Uh, Angel deduced that must be something that's going on with changing the structure of the liquid at different temperatures, and that's leading to that change of structure is leading to a change of the activation barrier. And therefore, he declared these to be fragile liquids. Um, this also means that an Arrhenius description is not appropriate for uh, fragile liquids, and therefore we need a viscosity model that has at least three parameters instead of two parameters, which is why the VFT equation has been used, the afromoth milchev equation, and so on, because they have three parameters instead of two parameters. Uh, but Angel took this one step further. So beyond this qualitative designation of strong versus fragile liquids, he also quantified the degree of fragility by defining this fragility index here, lowercase m. The fragility index is defined as the slope of this curve at the glass transition temperature. In other words, it is the slope of the base 10 logarithm of shear viscosity versus Tg over T evaluated at the glass transition temperature. So it's the slope at this point here. And what you'll see is that because of the common point here at the glass transition temperature and the high temperature limit, the lowest slope here would indicate just a straight line connection between the two. So the lowest slope, the minimum in fragility, um, indicates a strong liquid like silica or germania. Connecting the points here, you see this is 12, and this is minus five. And so um, the slope here, the minimum with fragility, according to this plot, would be approximately 17. Um, however, if you increase the slope, if you increase the slope, if you have a much steeper slope at the glass transition temperature, then this needs to turn around and give a much shallower slope at higher temperatures in order to converge to the same point in the infinite temperature limit. And therefore, this, what this means is that this first derivative property here of the fragility index, um, because of the common points, a first derivative can be used to describe something that's an inherently a second derivative property, namely the curvature here. This curvature indicates the non arrhenius scaling or the degree of fragility, but because of these common points, a slope or a first derivative is enough to describe that. So the higher the fragility index, the steeper the slope here at the glass transition temperature and the greater the curvature that you need. So this is great. And what this means is that um, there are just three parameters that we need to describe this liquid viscosity curve. There's the um, infinite temperature viscosity limit, which is a constant. And then there is the glass transition temperature which depends on composition, and then the fragility index, which also depends on composition. So let us um, you know, step back for a moment and consider 
a more physical model of the shear viscosity of a liquid. And um, one of the most important and influential of these is the Adam Gibbs model or the entropy model of viscosity. Um, now the Adam Gibbs model has a physical picture where they considered a liquid to consist of a number of regions that can cooperatively rearrange with each other. In other words, uh, the liquid has uh, now the atoms can't just move around on their own. They have to work together to flow cooperatively. So Adam and Gibbs considered that each one of these cooperatively rearranging regions is composed of a group of Z molecules and can rearrange itself independently of its environment. Uh, as the liquid is cooled and eventually supercooled, the size of these cooperatively rearranging regions grows progressively larger. So at really high temperatures where the viscosity is low, uh, these regions are fairly small and, and that it doesn't require a high degree of cooperativity to have flow. But if you lower the temperature, the viscosity is increasing, the flow is becoming slower and slower, and Adam and Gibbs postulated that it takes a, a much larger degree of cooperativity in order for that flow to occur. So the size of these cooperatively rearranging regions gets progressively larger as the temperature goes down and the viscosity goes up. Then Adam and Gibbs connected this, um, this increase of the size of the cooperatively rearranging regions to a corresponding decrease in the configurational entropy of the liquid. So they're connecting this now to a thermodynamic property. Um, and it makes sense that the configurational entropy should go down as the temperature goes down uh, and the size of the regions goes up because there are fewer and fewer possible configurations if you've got um, larger regions and a higher degree of cooperativity. And then this continues until the configurational entropy becomes zero in the limit of zero temperature. Now, the Adam and Gibbs model was derived um, from statistical mechanics, assuming an isothermal isobaric partition function here at delta, where what they considered here is that they're summing up over all possible states of the system, all possible combinations of energy E and volume V, where this uh, W here is just the number of states, and then you've got um, e to the minus enthalpy over kT. This is the internal energy contribution to the enthalpy, and then the PV contribution to the enthalpy. From the isothermal isobaric partition function, you can get the Gibbs free energy as just minus Boltzmann's constant times temperature times the natural log of that isothermal isobaric partition function. This would be the Gibbs free energy of the entire system. What Adam and Gibbs proposed is that there's only a certain subset of these states which would allow for flow to occur. Only a certain subset of this or a restricted set here where the summation is only over those states that allow for flow to occur. And if you only sum up over those particular states, you would get a restricted Gibbs free energy, which is labeled as, as G prime. And that's the same thing, but using the isothermal isobaric partition function delta prime, where the summation is just over those states that allow for a transition. Therefore, this gives us um, the fraction of systems that allow for a uh, transition. And that's just the ratio here of the partition functions, the ratio of the restricted partition function to the total partition function, so delta prime over delta. And this is equal to e to the minus the difference of Gibbs free energy between those two cases divided by kT. Um, hence, the probability of making a transition is going to be proportional to um, this fraction. So it's going to be equal to some constant times e to the minus. This Gibbs free energy difference between the two is just the size of the region times the chemical potential. You can see the definition here of this chemical potential difference shown here. Um, and then that's divided by kT. Now, the next thing that Adam Gibbs did was to um, sum up over all the possible um, sizes of the cooperatively rearranging region that would enable a transition. And what they assumed was that there is a minimum size of the region that would enable the transition, or in other words, a minimum degree of cooperativity for a viscous flow event to occur. 
and that minimum size is given by z equals z star. So if any system is at least that big, that would contribute to the, the probability of making a transition. So this summation here is a summation over z equals z star all the way to much larger cases. Um, now, according to the probabilities, this Boltzmann probability term, the smallest one is going to be the most likely case here. And so this was approximated, the summation was approximated as being just the case of z equals z star. And with that approximation, then the average transition probability is going to be proportional to e to the minus z star times the chemical potential difference over kt. So this z star is kind of picked out as being the size of the smallest cooperatively rearranging region that actually allows for a transition. In other words, the size of the cooperatively rearranging region that is large enough to enable a transition and yet still has the greatest probability out of all the um, possible sizes. The next thing that, that Adam Gibbs did was to um, write this in terms of configurational entropy. And what they considered is that the configurational entropy of the entire system here, the big S config, um, would be equal to the number of cooperatively rearranging regions times the configurational entropy of each one of those individual regions, where this little n here is Avogadro's number divided by the size of the region. So take all the atoms in the system, divide by um, how big each region is, that gives you the number of regions. Um, and therefore, the minimum size of the cooperatively rearranging region, C star, can be described as being um, the size of the system here, taken as Avogadro's number, times this ratio of the S star config. This is the um, configurational entropy of that Z star sized region divided by the total configurational entropy of the system. And then taking that equation and plugging it back into our um, equation for the probability of making a transition, uh, we get something of this form where it's a constant times E to the minus a bunch of stuff here in the numerator that is the entropy of the um, minimally sized uh, cooperatively rearranging region, a constant here, which is Avogadro's number, the chemical potential difference. And if you take all of that and also lump in Boltzmann's constant from the denominator, um, that was declared to be a constant here, C. And then the key part is in the denominator, where it's T times the configurational entropy of the liquid. So the final result of the Adam Gibbs model is that the molecular relaxation time, which is proportional to the viscosity, so tau, which is proportional to eta, um, following the Adam Gibbs model is proportional to e to the sum constant divided by temperature times the configurational entropy of the system. Or in other words, this is connecting a thermodynamic property of the liquid, the configurational entropy, to a kinetic property, the molecular relaxation time or the shear viscosity. And this is interesting because if the configurational entropy is effectively constant, then this predicts a, an Arrhenius scaling of viscosity. So it predicts a strong liquid. But if the configurational entropy here is varying as a function of temperature, then that is going to lead to non-Arrhenius scaling, or in other words, fragile liquid behavior. Now, there were a lot of um, you know, interesting physical insights to the Adam Gibbs model, and it does work remarkably well. Um, however, the Adam Gibbs model does not provide a means for calculating the size of the cooperatively rearranging regions or for that constant C in the numerator. It also is not, um, cannot be extended to um, like the, the very low temperature region where there is a thermal history dependence of the viscosity where the system departs from equilibrium and becomes non-equilibrium. That's a special case we're going to get to in the next lecture. Um, but this kind of brings us to um, when I started working in this field, and I was working at Corning at the time, and had some a very practical motivation about which one of these um, viscosity equations provides the most accurate description of the shear viscosity as a function of temperature data, and can we use those models to accurately predict the low temperature scaling of viscosity? So 
um, I had some very practical motivation, but also uh, wanted to address some of these um, interesting physics related questions where is there a universal viscosity model for all liquids? Um, is this prediction of VFT of a divergence temperature um, accurate or not? Spoiler alert, it's not. Um, and if it is accurate, is there some sort of thermodynamic singularity there? So a lot of people have speculated about that. Um, this goes back to uh, Walter Cosman's paper, uh, where basically if there is a viscosity divergence at that temperature, is there a forced thermodynamic phase transition or what's happening there from the thermodynamic point of view? But it turns out that, that the premise for the question is incorrect because in reality, you know, any um, kinetic property doesn't diverge until you get to absolute zero temperature because it's then and only then where you've got a truly zero probability of that kinetic event happening. So in reality, the viscosity only becomes infinite in the limit of zero temperature. So uh, my involvement here was actually to come up with a, um, a new model that provided a more accurate description of um, the viscosity temperature relationship. This is called the Maiega equation. And it starts with the Adam Gibbs equation here expressed in logarithmic units where um, you've got the base 10 logarithm of eta is equal to the base 10 logarithm of the infinite um, temperature of viscosity plus some unknown constant here it's labeled as b divided by temperature times the configurational entropy um, which is a function of temperature t and the composition x and what i did was to relate this configurational entropy function back to um, what's called the topological degrees of freedom here. This was building upon a work that was done by um, a researcher, Gordon Nalmas, at uh, UNAM, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. And he's a, a brilliant physicist who um, connected the configurational entropy of the liquid to um, basically what are the degrees of freedom that the atoms in the liquid have. Uh, how many different ways are the atoms able to move um, without having much cost and energy, which kind of relates back to Adam Gibbs' concept of a um, cooperative motion. Um, and so the key result from NOMIS was that there's a proportionality between these two quantities. Then I assumed kind of a simple two-state system here where you've got basically a rigid system or a flexible system with uh, this Boltzmann probability factor between the two of them, where in the limit of infinite temperature, the number of degrees of freedom is three per atom. So each atom would be able to move freely in the X, Y, or Z direction. So it's, the limit is three in the high temperature limit, and then the limit becomes zero in the low temperature limit. So this um, degrees of freedom per atom is, is varying between three and zero. And if you put those equations together, lump the unknown quantities together, you get this new three-parameter description of the viscosity with a log of viscosity is equal to the same parameter here, the infinite, the log of the infinite temperature of viscosity plus some constant k over t times e to the c over t. So it's one, two, three um, parameters, which is what we need to capture the non-Iranian scaling of viscosity. Um, you'll note that this only goes to infinity as the temperature goes to zero. So it's the same number of parameters as the VFT and Milch of equations. And if we want to compare um, kind of the intrinsic differences in shape among these three viscosity models, the VFT, the Afimov Milchev, and the Maiega equations, then um, it is helpful to do so in terms of a common set of parameters. The um, log eta infinity was already the same among the three models, but what we can do is take Angel's definition of the glass transition temperature Tg and the fragility index M and rewrite all of these viscosity equations in terms of the same set of three parameters, Tg, M, and eta infinity. So these are, are mathematically equivalent to what I showed you before, but now each of the three models is written in terms of the same parameters, eta infinity, Tg, and M. And now if we plot these, 
Um, so if we plot them for the same value of A to infinity, this is 10 to the minus four Pascal seconds, the same glass transition temperature and the same fragility, so the same slope here, this shows you some of the intrinsic shapes, uh, differences in shape between these three different models. Um, so the VFT equation here in blue is coming um, in with the greatest amount of curvature and the steepest slope at low temperatures because it's trying to get to infinity at finite temperature. Um, the avramov milchev equation is actually the shallowest um, here. Uh, it has the shallowest amount of curvature and the Maiega equation is coming somewhere in between, a little bit closer to the avramov milchev equation. And to understand the differences in the shapes here among these three different viscosity models, it's um, convenient to uh, use the Adam Gibbs interpretation to see what these models are predicting in terms of the scaling of the configurational entropy as a function of temperature. So this upper plot here shows the scaling of configurational entropy predicted by these three viscosity models um, as a function of Tg over T. So in this case, the zero is the infinite temperature limit. And what you can see is that both the Maiega equation and the VFT equation uh, predict a convergent configurational entropy in the infinite temperature limit, whereas the avramov milchev equation is predicting a divergent configurational entropy in the high temperature limit. Um, physically speaking, it should be convergent because um, the number of configurations is finite. It's a it's a you know exponentially large number, but it's not an infinite number of possible configurations. Um, if it's vibrational, that could of course go to much higher. But from a configurational point of view, it should be finite. And so the VFT and Maiega models are giving the more reasonable extrapolation in the high temperature limit. Now, if you take this x-axis and flip it, so now it becomes t over t tg, now the zero here on this lower plot is the is absolute zero temperature. And in this low temperature limit, you can see that the VFT equation is coming down and predicting zero entropy at a positive temperature. It's predicting zero entropy at um, its t0 parameter. And this uh, is what would give the infinite viscosity um, in terms of the VFT equation. Um, so from an Adam Gibbs point of view, that corresponds to a zero entropy, meaning only one configuration of the system is possible. Therefore, flow is not possible. Therefore, the viscosity will go to infinity. And people have read a lot into this, including a whole body of literature around what's called the Cosman paradox, uh, which is about you know what, what is the meaning of this um, disappearance of configurational entropy at finite temperature. Um, reality, though, is that at any positive temperature, there's always some probability of making a transition. And the much more realistic description is given by the Afromov Milchev or Maiega equations, where, um, yes, the, the configurational entropy is small, but it only becomes zero in the limit of absolute zero temperature, because that's the only time when the kinetics are completely forbidden. So in this low temperature limit, the AM model, the Maiega model, are both giving reasonable scaling. In the high temperature limit, it's the VFT and the Maiega model that give the reasonable scaling. And what this means is that um, basically, if you want to have a model that gives you a more accurate description across the full range of temperatures, it's really um, necessary to consider limiting behaviors and make sure that the predictions in the various limits, in this case, the high temperature and the low temperature limits, are both physically reasonable. And if you have that, then the chances of having uh, a more accurate model for everything in between becomes a lot higher. So this shows the Maiega model uh, predictions for a variety of different liquids here, um, strong liquid like silica, other um, more fragile oxide systems like window glass, aluminum silicate, basalt, and so on. Um, organic systems like glycerol, uh, orthoterphenol, ionic systems like this calcium nitrate, potassium nitrate mixture. And it you know, provides really good descriptions across the full range of fragilities. But the real test is 
Um, if you're given a set of high temperature viscosity data and you fit that high temperature viscosity data to the various models and use those functional forms to extrapolate to lower temperatures, how accurate is that prediction at lower temperatures? So in this particular test case, what we have here is a set of high temperature viscosity data measured using the rotational method. And then this point here is the softening point, which comes from parallel plate viscometry. Using only that set of data, fit it to get the optimized models according to the VFT, AM, and MIEGA functional forms, and then use those optimized models to extrapolate down to this lower temperature isocom. Isocom simply means constant viscosity. In this case, this is the 10 to the 11th Pascal second isocom temperature measured uh, via beam bending, and then see how the model predictions compare against the actual experimental measurement. And when we do that, what we see is that the, er the error here for VFT is significantly larger than the other models. And you can see the bias in the VFT model, where the, the VFT model is consistently over-predicting the actual isocom temperature by about nine and a half Kelvin. So this is because it's having such a large amount of curvature because it's trying to get to infinite viscosity. And um, this is actually a really large error. Uh, nine and a half degrees is uh, a huge error when it comes to, say, industrial manufacturing. Um, the AM model, which was the shallowest one, certainly does better but it has a systematic error in the opposite direction because its curvature is too shallow because of the unrealistic behavior in the high temperature limit. So VFT has unrealistic behavior in the low temperature limit. AM has unrealistic behavior in the high temperature limit. It is better for sure, um, but it's still in a pretty significant error there, um, about five and a half degrees of under prediction. With the Maega equation, it's kind of a Goldilocks problem. You know, we, we've got um, you know, best good limits in both the high and the low temperature side, and therefore the um, the error is it's within half a degree, which is within measurement error, which is basically one and a half Kelvin, uh, or plus or minus one Kelvin. So we're within the measurement error here, and so the Maega equation is effectively eliminating that um, error in the temperature dependence of uh, viscosity. So the next question becomes, why does VFT work so well then? Um, it is just an empirical equation as proposed in the 1920s because it gave a pretty accurate description of the temperature dependence of viscosity, so especially at high temperatures, and it did so quite economically with just three independent parameters. If you take the Maega equation shown here, um, and basically take this exponential, stick it into the denominator, it picks up a minus sign when you do that. And now if we consider the limit of high temperatures, so taking the limit of high temperatures, we can do a Taylor series approximation of this exponential truncate after the linear term. Um, and this becomes one minus K over T in that high temperature limit um, from this Taylor series approximation. Multiply the T through this fraction and what you get here is the C over T minus K. So this is exactly the same functional form as VFT. So in other words, the VFT equation can be um, derived from the Maek equation by taking the Taylor series expansion in the limit of high temperatures and keeping just the linear term. And what this means is that the VFT equation is most accurate um, at high temperatures, which it is, and then as you go to lower and lower temperatures, it becomes less and less accurate, which is what's observed. Um, another question is about um, kind of the, the validity of what uh, Angel had observed with respect to the universality of eta infinity or the universality of this um, high temperature limit of viscosity. The VFT model um, is predicting, um, you know, fairly small scatter here around um, 10 to the minus four Pascal seconds for eight infinity. It's basically 10 to the minus four uh, plus or minus, you know, logarithmic units of 0.6 or so. Because of the difference in the functional forms, the efremov milchev equation with its much uh, shallower uh, curvature is actually predicting a higher, 
high temperature limit um, closer to 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus one and a half Pascal seconds. The Mayake equation for the same set of data is actually predicting somewhere in the middle, 10 to the minus three uh, Pascal seconds, and it's showing the narrowest spread. Um, and so this is actually pretty strong evidence for um, the universality of eta infinity and for that value of being closer to 10 to the minus three Pascal seconds. So what this means is that um, the lower limit of fragility index as defined by Angel is really 10 minus or minus three. So it's closer to 15 instead of the original 17 that was predicted by um, Angel. Now we're gonna end the lecture with a few special topics. Um, the first is non-Newtonian viscosity. And um, everything that we've considered up to this point has been Newtonian viscosity, meaning that the coefficient of viscosity is the same independent of the um, applied stress or independent of the uh, shear rate exhibited by the fluid. However, um, what we what we can observe here, so this is shear stress versus the shear strain rate. Newtonian here would be a straight line, and the slope of that would give you the viscosity, which would be a constant viscosity with respect to the shear strain rate. Uh, for non-Newtonian flow, um, there is some sort of nonlinearity that can be observed. For example, with this dilatant system, for a dilatant system, the um, apparent viscosity is actually increasing as a function of shear rate. So the viscosity or the resistance to flow is becoming greater the faster that you shear it. Um, the opposite of that would be pseudoplastic. With pseudoplastic, the apparent viscosity is decreasing as you increase the shear rate. Um, and then another case is what's called a Bingham plastic. A Bingham plastic is where it doesn't flow until you reach some critical shear stress, and then it starts flowing. Um, so a few examples of these are for Bingham plastic, the classic example is toothpaste. If you've got a tube of toothpaste, unscrew the cap, hold it upside down, the toothpaste is not going to flow. It doesn't flow until you squeeze it. In other words, it doesn't flow until you apply a shear stress and then um, you would get flow behavior. So toothpaste is an example of a Bingham plastic. Um, something that is pseudoplastic, uh, this is also called shear thinning because the apparent viscosity is becoming lower. Um, an example of that is actually blood. So you know, you, when your heart beats and it applies this stress to the blood, uh, your blood cells, it actually enables it to flow more easily because of the shear thinning or pseudoplastic behavior of blood. Um, for dilatant or shear thickening, um, the classic example is a cornstarch and water mixture where uh, the faster you um, shear it, the more resistance it puts up to shear flow. And you can see kind of people dancing on uh, cornstarch water mixtures if they move their feet fast enough. Um, another special topic is volume viscosity. Uh, everything that we've covered so far has been shear viscosity. It is also possible to define a volume viscosity here, eta sub V, which is the ratio between the hydrostatic stress that is applied, or in other words, the pressure that is applied, versus the volumetric deformation rate here, V dot. So this is the same thing, but having, um, instead of biaxial stresses and strain rates, you have a triaxial stress, or in other words, a pressure change versus a volumetric deformation rate. And the ratio between those two defines the volume viscosity. Um, this is not used very much because it is um, very difficult to measure. In fact, there's almost no literature out there that deals with the topic of volume viscosity because it is so difficult to measure. Um, so this slide is just to, to make you aware of the existence. And another special topic is what's called the fragile to strong transition. There are some systems, especially some of these metallic alloys. So this is, for example, lanthanum aluminum nickel alloy or lanthanum aluminum nickel copper alloy that appear to be uh, fragile at high temperatures, uh, but appear to be strong liquids at low temperatures, meaning that there's some sort of fragile to strong transition that occurs as a function of temperature. 
And the traditional three parameter viscosity models are insufficient for describing this fragile to strong transition. Um, so one extension of the Maega equation to capture that, this extended Maega equation, instead of considering a, a two well system with just kind of a rigid and floppy state, it has an intermediate state in between. And that actually gives a five parameter viscosity model instead of a three parameter viscosity model where there's still the same eta infinity, but then there are two terms here. One of these becomes the fragile term with two parameters, W1 and C1. The other one becomes the strong term with uh, two parameters here, W2 and C2. And with those two terms, you can see the, the strong and the fragile terms plotted here, the fragile term, strong term. And when you put them together with this extended Mayaka equation, it gives you the solid red line here that captures that transition between the fragile and strong regimes. Um, so we've reached the end of this lecture. To summarize, viscosity defines the resistance of a liquid to flow, and it varies by many orders of magnitude as a function of temperature. Do, uh, different measurement techniques are required to measure different viscos viscosities in different regimes because it varies by so many orders of magnitude. Um, following ANGEL, we can uh, classify liquids as either strong or fragile, depending on if they exhibit erroneous or non erroneous scaling of viscosity with temperature, and several different models exist to describe that dependence. So when we come back next time, we're going to deal with um, what happens when you cool to such low temperatures that you undergo a glass transition. Um, we're going to cover the glass transition itself and how that influences the non-equilibrium viscosity. So thank you so much, and I'll see you next time.